This is Pete Moore on Halo Talks NYC. I have the pleasure of bringing in a reciprocal podcast, Halo Talks, to move to live more, Dr. Amy Bantham, and we are going to talk about moving. We're going to talk about the health club industry morphing into the destination to help more and more people and what resources are available for you as a health club operator, studio operator, indoor, outdoor professional to make the change that you need to make in your community. So, Amy, good to see you again. Good to see you, Pete. I have had my own podcast for about three years now, and I occasionally guest on others, but I'm so used to being the host. So I'll try not to take hosting responsibilities away. All right, well, we'll keep you in your place, but you've got to <laughs> move. You got to move to live more. So that's right. Do what that's... you got to do. Do what you got to do. So, um, look, you've been in the uh, in the industry for uh, for quite some time, you know, about the same as, as uh, Dave and I. You know, you've done certain things on the consulting side and research side. So, you know, talk about, uh, you know, in short order here, you know, what brought you to this movement and initiative and, um, you know, how our community can make sure that we're in line with you on, uh, on making things happen and seeing results. Yeah. So I started in the industry in the late nineties and I started as a group exercise instructor and I just absolutely love teaching group exercise. I love the industry I was working in management consulting, and I realized that it was what I was doing during my lunch hour, which got me up every day. And so I went and I worked with Ursa for over 10 years. And while I was with Ursa, I was working on advocacy and health promotion and health policy. And while I was there, I recognized in helping them set up the Ursa Foundation that what I really wanted to do more of was to expand access to physical activity opportunities. And I saw my path forward to do that included going to get my doctor of public health. And so I spent three years doing that. And while I was doing that, I recognized that I really wanted to start my own organization because I didn't really see that anyone was doing exactly what I wanted to do, which was to connect three sectors, healthcare, health and fitness, and communities. And so that's how I launched Move to Live More. That's great. You know, as you look at a number of different groups that form, you know, whether they're charitable organizations, whether they're, you know, nonprofits, whatever, you know, you want to actually classify them as, you know, there's always like expense ratios that you want to look at and say, hey, how much money is going into the community? How much money is being used in, in advertising? I guess the ones that bother me the most are the ones where there's animals that are sick and you got to, you know, rent a turtle for 19 a month. But, you know, their their marketing costs are way more than what they should be. Uh, and they're actually there and they don't do anything about the animals. Be that as it may, you know, how do you kind of look, how do you look and say, hey, you know, I could probably align with someone else um, and maybe change their mission. Um, I could start my own and then maybe have other people kind of dovetail into what I'm doing. So talk us through how, you know, nonprofits and, and, and movements works for those that may want to think they want to start their own. Maybe they could align with you instead. Yeah, I really wanted to focus on expanding access to physical activity. And so thinking very narrowly about getting a small group of people even fitter or getting people who might already have access to programming and services, that was not really where my passion was. I wanted to create a movement of movement because I was coming at it from a real population and community health perspective and how you and I believe so strongly in the healing power of movement. And so how can we bring others along with us? And so I wanted to do that not by bringing people into a doctor's office, but by using clinicians to talk to every single one of their patients to get people moving out in the community. But we can't just be about talk. It's really connecting people to programming and services. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about impact and enabling large scale change and bringing about this movement of movement. So that's what I was really focused on. 
Yeah, so we, um, you know, we wrote a book recently, you know, Time to Win Again, which basically like 52 takeaways, effectively a playbook on how you run your business like a sports team. When you started or where you're at right now, talk about what, what does the playbook entail? So I've aligned with lots of different types of organizations, all of whom align with my mission, to, which is to help people live healthier, longer, more active lives. So when I'm thinking about who I want to partner with and collaborate with and work with, obviously mission, most important. And then I'm also thinking about impacting people across the lifespan and health span. So I work with organizations that, foundations and nonprofits that work with elementary schools, for example, because that's where a lot of my passion is, investing early in kids, getting them moving so that they grow up to be active, healthy adults. So thinking about across the lifespan, across the health span, also thinking about older adults, because we recognize how important it is to keep older adults moving and to address loss of muscle math and mass and to address chronic disease. So I'm also thinking about people working in that space. I'm very focused on innovation and people who are people in organizations who are changing the paradigm around movement. So I align and collaborate with a lot of startups. When you take a look at, I become an ambassador or I become part of the movement. Um, what resources do you give me or how do you help me um, maybe reframe my programming, reframe my schedule, um, provide me support and conviction? Uh, talk, talk about how you, you, you're, you and your team basically say, hey, somebody wants to, do outdoor workouts in a park. Let me give you best practices. Let me tell you, you know, what I, sh what I should be doing how, what's the length of time. Talk about that. Cause I think a lot of people have great ideas yeah. and want to devote the time and maybe get, you know, stopped in their own tracks by saying, what should I, what do I do next? Or how, how do I pressurize the community or how do I grassroots market to them? Yeah. So if I, if I had to speak broadly about what I do, I would say that I help clients in three main areas. One is communication and messaging and framing. One is in program evaluation. And one is in gathering and sharing best practices in order to implement those best practices. Exactly what you just described. Got it. And so I work with for example, commercial health and fitness centers who are thinking about how to message and market to their current members and to potential members. And I help them think through a science-based, evidence-based messaging strategy. And so we're all talking now about the linkage and connection between physical activity and mental health. So I'll gather the data across different demographics I will help them think through what a messaging and marketing campaign might look like so that people can move for better mental health. It's Mental Health Awareness Month as it is National uh, Physical Fitness and Sports Month. So what is that all-important connection? And then thinking through how to make that relevant to and actionable by their members and potential members. So communication is one bucket. Program evaluation is another bucket. So I will go in and look at, for example, I'll talk about, uh, I worked with a medical fitness center, looked at their physician exercise referral program, uh, interviewed and surveyed their physicians, their health coaches, their registered dietitians, their personal trainers, and tried to understand what were barriers to them making that program the best possible program that it could be. And by success, we're thinking about patient health outcomes and conversion to membership in their health and fitness center. And then the last bucket is, I'm really a, a mixed methods researcher. So I do quantitative research, I do qualitative research. And so one of the clients that I worked with to develop a playbook 
is a, it's an organization called the Daily Mile. It's an elementary school, in-school physical activity intervention. I did focus groups for them where I talked with 50 school administrators and teachers and parents and community advocates and really tried to understand what were their pain points, what did the kids need, what did the teachers need, and how the Daily Mile as a program might be able to help teachers teach and kids learn and the role that physical activity played there. And then I compiled it all into a a summary of findings and a toolkit for moving forward and a strategic plan. And then I helped them operationalize that strategic plan, which helped them triple the number of kids who are getting active through the Daily Mile in the U.S. So is that, so the Daily Mile, so, so that now is a program proven, tested, has a playbook to it can now be deployed, if you will, off the shelf uh, for other districts or other schools or, you know, private, public, what have you? Yeah, it's an evidence-based turnkey program free. There are over 4 million kids around the world participating, 20,000 schools, and I was able to work with the Daily Mile in the United States to make it more relevant to schools help them see a path forward to success in their school and to get kids up and moving, which is what you and I are all about. And I imagine your listeners as well. Sure. So if you take a look at, you know, let's focus on, on public schools for a minute. Um, if I'm a health club operator or if I am a personal trainer and I, maybe one of my kids goes to that school, um, or a relative, uh, or a friend, or, or or a member's son or daughter. What is have you seen a lot of? Well, what are some of the, the the reasons why school districts or principals or somebody says no, we're not doing this? Is it is it time? Is that mind your own business? Uh, what what are some of the things that you have to to to, to bump up against in order to to, to make these things happen? Yes, I would say there are a lot of barriers. Time is certainly one of them. If I'm a for-profit health and fitness center that wants to do more with my school systems, fantastic. And how do we move forward? I actually work with a friend and colleague, Tom Richards, and we advise health, commercial health and fitness centers, how they can be more essential to stakeholders in their communities healthcare systems, businesses, and yes, schools. And so how can commercial health and fitness centers partner with schools and overcome time barriers, staffing barriers, curriculum barriers? And that's an important piece of it. I try to work with my local district. I sit on our district wellness committee I have for seven years. It's mm-hmm. work that I started to do because my kids weren't getting enough physical activity. And I said, how can we change this? And so I got involved and I ran up against those same barriers that I talked about. Time, staffing, weather, it was 50 degrees and they were telling us that, oh, we can't get the kids outside. It's, it's too cold. Well, 50 degrees in Boston is a pretty balmy day. So let's get them out there. So I worked with our district wellness committee and we changed the policies and put a, a weather band around it. So we're getting kids out more. But again, implementation became a challenge. So I tried to connect our school system with for-profit commercial health and fitness centers who have the staffing and the expertise and bring them together to do more after-school programming. And so challenging, but working together to try to create creative solutions. What do, uh, I don't know if this has come up before. I'm, I'm one, in one ideation session, I remember we came up with it. I don't know if anybody ever did anything with it, but you know, as I remember back in, in elementary school, you had to get a permission slip, you know, when you go to a uh, Statue of Liberty or you go to a museum or I remember one time we went to the prison, scared the shit out of us and myself and all my friends um, in Nassau County. 
Um, you know, are there field trips where at two o'clock in the afternoon, instead of going to gym class, like we're actually going to the local health club and we're going to take a tour. Um, we're going to find out how to do exercise. We're going to, you know, you know, expose kids to a gym that maybe their parents don't bring them to, uh, or they only know it from the daycare side of it where they got dropped off at some point. Um, I feel like there are little things related to exposure and entry points that, you know, you could say, hey, this is the most relevant field trip about your health and fitness that you're ever going to take as probably within a five or 10 minute, you know, bus ride of the school. Is that happening? Should that be happening? Have you already done it? Should I shut up now? Should I continue? I'm just kidding. Well, you should continue. Let's keep talking about it because it is a great idea. It's a really important thing to do to, if you look at it from the commercial health and fitness center side, you're building a pipeline of future members. Exactly. And employees. Yeah. And if you're looking at it from the school side, they are challenged by and scrambling to find active programming for their, in the case I was working on, it was after school programming. The model that I was working on more was trying to get fitness professionals into the schools. Right. But I also work with, I work with a, a local health and fitness center called HealthWorks that has a program for preteen girls, which brings them into the club at off hours and does programming for them, which I think is a wonderful way to address the immediate needs of parents and preteens and particularly girls and really raise the visibility of the health and fitness center as a partner for the community. So, you know, are there certain case studies or you know, either big wins or little wins that, that you say, you look, if you want to get started now, here's where I'd want you to start. Obviously you've got a lot of options and you've got a lot of playbooks, but you know, what is the, the one thing that somebody should do after this podcast that, that you would want them to do, you know, as an action step in their community? Yeah, I think it's where I start in my work when I'm working with clients is to try to understand the biggest pain point and the biggest need in the community. So what, what does my community need from me as a commercial health and fitness center? And maybe it's the fact that a school simply doesn't have the staffing to do active after-school programs, which is the example that, that I gave. And so they're doing chess and knitting and so is there an opportunity for the schools, to, for, for the commercial health and fitness center to come into the schools as a solution? We understand this is your pain point in, and your problem. We have a solution. And so that's really where I start. Is it a broader community-based problem where there's a particularly high level of stress and anxiety and depression? And can, we as a provider of physical activity programming, can we be a solution for that and making that really important linkage between movement and mental health and demonstrating that we offer evidence-based, data-driven, science-informed programming, and we can be a trusted partner with you. So let's find a way to move forward together. That's great. You know, I think a lot of the specialists, whether you know how to do yoga, or you know how to do um, any kind of small group training, maybe you've done some work with kids, even if it's sports performance, or if it's just, you know, general health, I think a lot of people that that get attached to you and your movement, just go register your name and your information with the schools and say, look, I'm available, I'll come down here for 30 minutes, I'll come here for an hour, I'll take over one of your health classes, I'll take over one of your physical therapy um, you know, physical exercise classes instead of playing dodgeball, give me 20 minutes, you know, to do some breath work. So I feel like the commercial industry really needs to go and infuse ourselves into the schools um, as well as into the senior communities where people are looking for programming. They're looking for connectivity. 
They're looking to solve loneliness. So we love what you're doing. Uh, we're going to put all your information up, get that around to our entire network and, um, you know, look forward to, to making big things happen on, on a micro basis. That's going to change how everyone feels and looks and, uh, and achieves more. So great to have you on, on the show here again. Thanks so much, Pete. Let's create that movement of movement to get people to move, to live more. Awesome.